Jonathan Webb's son, was nicknamed Action Jackson because of his exuberance and energy when Jackson began having trouble walking at age seven, the family began a diagnostic and treatment odyssey. Months of uncertainty followed. As a black family, were their concerns even being heard? Then it became, how do you balance lengthy treatments, school, and the rest of life? And how do you deal with the grief of the transition from normalcy to a new, unfamiliar place? A decade later, Jackson is in remission and doing well. Jackson and his dad will share reflections to help clinicians support families and patients walking similar paths with a chronic condition. Jonathan has spent almost 20 years in the public health space promoting community health outcomes, addressing the social determinants of health, and tackling a number of epidemics. Jonathan's professional experience includes work for two local health departments and almost 15 years in the nonprofit space. Jonathan serves on the March of Dimes National Advisory Committee, is co-chair for the work group on dismantling racism and addressing unequal treatment for the Mom and Baby Action Network, and is a public member of the American Board of Pediatrics Foundation. He's also a new member of the Obama Leader USA inaugural cohort. Welcome to the stage, Jonathan Webb. Good morning. Thank you to the Academy for not only the opportunity to share our family story, but for your commitment to centering the patient experience. Before we get started, if you would humor me, would you turn to your neighbor and give them either a high five or a COVID-friendly head nod or fist bump? And then turn to your second choice and do the same for them. I like to start some of my conversations with this when I'm talking to providers because I want to offer you a sincere thank you. I know the work that you often do can be thankless, but I wanted to offer you that among your colleagues. I grew up playing sports, and one of the things that was important to me when we played sports is to always give ourselves an attaboy or an encouragement. So the high five is symbolic of that for me, but it's also a reminder that we're part of the same team. So thank you very much for being here, for your commitment to your patients, to your commitment to your communities. Today we're going to provide some insight on our journey with a rare chronic illness from a couple of different vantage points, but let me start with a little bit about myself. This is me as a young child. I am now a dutiful son, a blessed husband, and a grateful father. My mother tells me that while other kids were talking about all the things they wanted to be when they grew up, as a child at the top of my list was that I wanted to be a father. Perhaps this is the reason why when my wife and I found that we were going to be um, parents after a year of marriage, I was beyond happy. Filled with the excitement, love, uncertainty, and fear like most parents, we welcomed our son Jackson into this world after a relatively typical pregnancy. As Jackson grew, during the day his elementary school teachers and classmates knew him as the mild-mannered mayor. Uh, because of his interest in meeting new classmates and connecting them to each other. But at night, family and friends, he became Action Jackson. Because if you looked up the definition of activity and emotion in the dictionary, there would be a picture of him. Jackson loved to run, play basketball, football, baseball, run around in the playground, and dance. Things were good. I am so thankful for the relationship he had with his teachers who truly saw him, and based on that relationship, noticed a change in his activity level and physical ability. They gave us a call to let us know that something was off. His kindergarten PE teacher, Mr. Green, let us know that Jackson had gone from being one of the fastest and strongest kids in his class to barely being able to run a lap. 
and that his gait had significantly changed over the course of several weeks. My wife and I began to pay closer attention to this and noticed that the energy at home was waning and we confirmed what his teachers were seeing. Action Jackson was spending most of his time on the ground entertaining his four-month-old sister instead of launching himself off the couch or taking the stairs two at a time. In fact, he could barely climb the steps without assistance. What we thought previously was simply an attentive brother may have also been mixed with something else, an inability to move around so much. We panicked and wanted to urgently find out what was up with our boy. The process from that point became both scary and frustrating. We had an incredibly supportive pediatrician in Dr. Janet Maurer who listened to us, but she acknowledged that she wasn't entirely certain what was going on. She referred us to specialists for further support, and we began a six-month search for a diagnosis. Visits to pediatric orthopedic surgeons ruled out musculoskeletal disorders and led us to neurology. Jackson was asked to undergo a clinical evaluation, after which the specialist told us that because we had another baby recently, Jackson's little sister, that he was making up his illness and therefore faking his inability to perform the office physical tests, like getting up from the floor without using his hands, which we will later learn was a standard presentation of his illness. They told us that he wasn't ill, but that this was his way of getting attention. It was at this point that we, and by we I mean my wife, who is very meticulous, began documenting the changes via video as a way to prove that what we were seeing wasn't fabricated and it wasn't a child's desperate plea for attention. Midway through our diagnostic journey, we found ourselves in the unfortunate situation of being without our employer-provided health care for 90 days. I had just started a new job, and my wife, a recent law school grad, was working for a legal temp agency, and our benefits had not kicked in yet. This prevented us from being able to be seen for further follow-up, which ultimately delayed treatment. During this uninsured period, we continued to meticulously track his decline, charting all changes and documenting with videos any new losses. My wife shared that this, during this window, in a cruel twist of fate, the celebration of our daughter's progression from crawling and pulling up to eventually walking was juxtaposed by our son's same movements in the reverse. We also focused our efforts on research. We both have advanced degrees and are no strangers to research. We began pouring through medical journals and online forums, eventually finding our way to the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital and a newly opened neuromuscular clinic. Due to our insurance loss, it took us several months to get in for a lumbar puncture and nerve conduction studies and a diagnosis of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> this is an autoimmune-mediated peripheral neuropathy in which the body attacks the myelin sheaths, disrupting the brain's signal to the extremities, causing neuropathy, weakening, and loss of feelings in the arms and legs, and loss of reflex. Experts believe it's related to the more commonly known Guillain-Barre syndrome. The diagnosis was secondarily confirmed at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia after my wife found their publications on CIDP and cold called the neurology team to ask if they could please take a look at Jackson. Given the rareness of his illness, 
they were thankfully very interested in meeting with us and thus began our partnership with Dr. Sabrina Yum. Our provider shared at this time that this illness was so rare that you could fill two football stadiums and find one person in the crowd with CIDP. We were told that given the progressive nature of this disease, that this illness might end up with Jackson being in pain and non-ambulatory by the age of 12. And that treatment would include weekly infusions for the foreseeable future. Our treatment plan included beginning with the lowest cost option for several months to see how he responded. When this didn't work, we had to petition to move to a higher, more effective option. We would later learn that we lost precious time during this window between diagnosis and fine tuning of treatment and that there is the potential that irreparable damage had been done. After connecting with other parents of kids with GBS and CIDP through support groups, we learned that our paths to diagnosis and treatment were similar, expectedly filled with trial and error, and in some cases requiring families to provide evidence of a subtle decline and prove their cases to a skeptical care team. Our treatment experience was filled with difficult, although we was, was filled was, was difficult, although we partnered well with our specialist, we still fought with payers to get things approved. Struggle with a complex process for scheduling treatment services, battle with people's perception of what medication or supports our family could afford, and the list goes on and on. My wife became our son's greatest advocate and door opener finding loopholes and befriending administrators to make sure we got the care we needed. We got everything we needed, but in some cases, we had to fight through barriers to get it. All of this while trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy for our son. Our journey from that point to diagnosis to treatment was filled with ups and downs and a variety of experiences in the healthcare system. We had a supportive pediatrician and now an attentive and interested pediatric neurologist. We encountered many caring and dedicated nurses who made our lives so much easier. But we also encountered a couple that made it challenging. I recall one such instance when a nurse made our son feel guilty when she was unable to find his vein for one of his infusions after sticking a 10-year-old seven or eight times in his arms, his hands, and his wrist. We now have a home nurse Dr. Shivago Bunting, we call him Z, um, who is like an extended member of our family. And Z finds the vein on the first try every time. We have some not so pleasant experiences battling the payer system in consistent fights to get treatments approved and paid for. But we also encountered some really engaged members within that system who've helped us to navigate and get through the bureaucratic roadblocks. We are still on this journey, but despite the prognosis, we are still here. And so is Jackson, who just celebrated his 18th birthday this week. And because we have always advocated for him to have his own voice, I would like to invite Jackson to the stage to share his experience from his standpoint. Jackson. Before I begin, I'd like to start by saying that I'm very honored that all of you would come here to hear our story, and thank you to the American Academy of Pediatrics for this opportunity to share my experience. My name is Jackson Webb, and I love to read, play video games, and I've curated the perfect Spotify playlist. I'm currently a senior in high school with plans to head off to college in the fall, and as previously stated by my dad, I have a rare chronic disease called CIDP. The spring that I got sick, I was obsessed with Legos, old school cartoons, particularly Rocky and Bullwinkle, and my new baby sister. I wanted to be with her all the time, and making her laugh was one of my favorite things.
I don't know for sure when it started, but I remember having less energy than usual and a strange feeling in my hands and feet. It was like they were constantly buzzing. I, I always remember falling down more and my legs would buckle when I would try to run or jump. The worst thing was trying to climb stairs. I just didn't have the energy, I couldn't do it anymore. They gave me a key to use the elevator at my new school, which was pretty cool, but I think I would have preferred to be able to run. I spent a lot of time going to different doctors doing the same tests over and over again. Push my hands away. Pull my hands in. Don't let me push your arms and push down on my hand like you're pushing on a gas pedal. My mom had to remind them that I'd never driven a car, so <laughs> I might have trouble with that one. I didn't know the right answers to these tests, so I always tried my best to follow the directions, even when they did weird things like poke my feet with a pin or put cold things on my legs to see if I could feel it. One of the doctors told my parents that I was just faking it because I was jealous of my sister, but I wasn't jealous of my sister. I loved her so much, and I often told my parents that she was actually mine because I prayed for her every night before she was born. <laughs> Once we figured out what was going on with me, I spent lots of time in the day hospital receiving infusions of steroids and then IVIG. The days were long, and depending on how I felt, sometimes the treatments had to be split over two days. I want to give a big thank you to all of the hospital volunteers and child life specialists that helped me pass the time during these long infusions. Growing up with this condition pushed me to mature quickly and recognize responsibility over my body and constantly checking for any sign of deterioration. By the beginning of my high school career, I had made such remarkable progress that my doctor cleared me to stop medications and participate in high school sports. I enjoyed playing baseball for my high school's team for two years and I also ran track and cross country. I had even gotten to a place where I could squat about 400 pounds for 10 reps and a couple of sets. <laughs> but in April of 2023, more than 10 years after my initial diagnosis, I began to lose function again. I remember having muscle weakness to a degree that it was comparable to when I was first diagnosed. Simple tasks like taking notes in class or typing on my keyboard became difficult to perform for long periods of time. Neuropathy presented itself again, manifesting in those familiar, painfully prickly sensations along my hands and back. The entire experience gave me flashbacks of the helplessness I felt when I was initially diagnosed, and I began to doubt whether I had it in me to push myself back onto the road before I, to where I was before I got sick. My family and I traveled to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in order to consult my neurologist, and I think part of me was expecting to be told that there was nothing we could do but wait for further decline until I lost all my mobility. I'm happy to report that with lots of PT work and after resuming IVIG treatments, I've been able to regain all of my strength. I still receive infusions, but we do them at home now with a nurse who has helped me for the last five years. Ultimately, my life as a patient has molded me into the person that I am today. My journey with this rare disease has equipped me with important life skills like tenacity, empathy, and hope. I'm now a trained patient advocate with the patient's organization and I have visited Capitol Hill several times to lobby for rare disease research and access to treatments. As a result of my frequent exposure to medicine, I plan to study biology and I hope to be able to use my knowledge in conjunction with my lived experience to offer the best help that I can to research more efficient and effective paths to medical treatments for individuals with rare diseases.
Our family has been on this journey, as Jackson mentioned, for more than 10 years. And here is what we'd like to offer you from our perspective. The healthcare system, in my opinion, is unnecessarily difficult to access and can be even harder to navigate. It shouldn't require the stars aligning with insurance, advanced degrees to review medical journals, cold calling specialists and hoping they take interest in your issue, and countless hours of fighting with the insurance company for approval of treatment my provider deemed necessary to get the care needed. I shudder to think what our outcome would have been if any of these stars hadn't aligned for us, or if we weren't proficient in English, for example, or if we um, didn't have the jobs that afforded us the type of schedules to do the research we did, or didn't have the coverage that we ultimately ended up getting so our family got the treatment that we desperately needed. U.S. physicians, please continue to advocate for your patients. In many instances, a patient brings all of their healthcare baggage and the, weight of the and the weight of navigating this complex system with them to your visits, along with the worry and pain of whatever illness they're battling. Our challenge to you is to see them. See them for who they are, the person, not just the patient, and not just the illness. Those providers who took the time to check in with us to learn about what we were going through and seemed to genuinely care about us made a world of difference on some very dark days. We know the healthcare system doesn't often allow for significant time to be spent with patients, but this connection in Felix's scene is so important. Given this unsupportive system structure for meaningful interaction between patients and providers, physicians are often placed in positions to quickly evaluate a situation and presented illness. I don't know if it was due to limited time, an individual's bedside manner, or something else like bias, but we struggle to be truly seen in those earlier visits. Our charge to you is to see past the phenotype of a patient or the case study that indicates that a person of a certain color or socioeconomic status will present a certain way. If necessary, challenge any bias that might exist and see me, my family, and those patients that you experience as the unique people that we are. See your patients as partners. We started with a genuine partner in Dr. Maurer who acknowledged her knowledge gap on our particular rare disease, but committed to finding us help. We ended with a committed partner in Dr. Yum, who has helped us to get to this point. Along the way, we have partnered with countless others, like Z, who help us figure out the healthcare system every day. We have been better for these partnerships. We trust your expertise and your training, and not but, we also have a lived experience and perspective that matters, and are excited to have you work alongside us for the care of our children. Remember our humanity. Although this wasn't a major issue during our journey, the opportunities on, the, on our horizon with the introduction of AI are exciting. As we explore those options, let's work hard not to lose sight of the necessary humanity that is the blessing and the gift that we receive for taking advantage of opportunities to connect and understand each other. Last, as you meet the many healthcare needs of the countless patients whose lives you impact, take the time to be mindful that just like you, your patients and their families want to be healthy. They want to be safe. They want to feel loved. They want to be seen. They want this for themselves and for their families, just like you. On behalf of our family, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning, and thank you for your continued dedication to your patients, families, the communities you serve, and to the practice of medicine. Thank you.